Um, hello, everyone. Uh, the preview sec is going to be a tough one to follow uh, because Jama's work is awesome. And at the end of his talk, he talked about VR. So this is actually the, some of the topic of my talk. So yeah, let's start with that. Uh, my name is Quentin, and I was, traced, I was trained as a CG artist, and I work in all sorts of fields, from motion design to um, illustration, print and web media, lots of stuff. A few years ago, with a bunch of friends in the audience, I co-founded the Belgian Blender user group, and uh, we're still going strong. And I also teach Blender for various uses in companies, fab labs, and even schools lately. Um, so let's get to the project. The client, um, it's Terra Game Center. They are a um, growing company. They are pretty awesome. So on the picture, it's uh, Sofiane and Ismail. Um, and it's, um, some, it's um, a VR gaming center, of course. And they offer, uh, like all VR gaming center, the tethered solo arcade boss, but also um, untethered gameplay. So anyone heard of untethered gameplay for VR? Maybe in the audience, no? A few hands, but not that many. OK. So it's quite easy, actually. Untethered gameplay is when you are completely immersed in the game and you can move freely. Because in VR, the, um, the com what's cumbersome about the, like the everyday or every the, the most classic VR is that you have this big cable connecting your headset to a computer, so you are restricted to an area. And this gameplay allows you to walk inside a big area and interact with other players inside the um, CG world. So how does it work? Because that's actually, um, I need to explain you that so you can understand the work I did for them later. Um, so you have an array of infrared cameras on the ceiling. And um, those cameras pick up uh, LEDs, special LEDs and sensors on the gears and the players that are underneath them. Of course, you need custom software to be able to run that and to customize the gameplay. That's why they make their own games for this big surface, this big area. Um, and right now, they have a Haunted House uh, game, game, I think. And they're working on another one involving magic. This is going to be really, really cool. Um, and as it's custom games, they need custom gear. Um, the, the way this custom gear works is actually props with sensors strapped to them. So regarding sensors, you have two options with the technology they show to use, which is the OptiTrack one. Either you buy the, um, this is the laser, yeah, the fully fledged one or the bare bone versions. Um, those are really tiny things that cost a lot of money. Um, and so they chose to go with the bare bones versions because who wants to have the same sensor and really camera something on every piece of gear? So they thought about 3D printing. Um, because this way you can really customize and make really custom props um, with the, gear, the, the, the sensors inside, and the players maybe don't even actually know that there are sensors inside, they just use the props. Um, they started with another company than, than, my, than me um, to be able to start the games. So they made some first enclosures, uh, a first version of a helmet, um, so those are some pictures of it. And um, this allowed them to start developing their games. So those images you see here are the, what the IR camera see. So you can really see that it's really like a mocap suit. You have uh, white spots on the dark background, and uh, then the software can track them. Um, this is where they notice the problems, of course, because this is the joys of R&D. Um, so the IR, the infrared LEDs are really, really fragile. Um, also, they were glued into place inside of the models, which made really repairing really not easy and impossible in some cases. And three types of enclosures quite limiting the gameplay, the possible gameplay. Also, with the previous company, which was the most important thing for them, they didn't own, they didn't own the file and they had to pay per print. So this is where I come in. And I was asked a bunch of sort of features and, and questions to make sure that um, the new versions and the improved thing and um, yeah, the, the, the steps that I would 
the, the stones that they would lay up for the future of their work would be good and, and really future-proof. So I, re I, re I needed to rethink everything from scratch, uh, make them less bulky, not possible in all cases, uh, glue less, protect the LEDs, and fit bigger batteries inside because the sensors requires uh, power. And then, who said battery, you need, you need to charge them, and when you have people coming on the games all day long, then you need to charge them several times a day, and that's not ideal. And yeah, make more gear. On the client side, so the client, it's a gaming center. They are not uh, 3D printing experts, and so it must be easy to print, as they are planning on opening new centers and licensing. Um, this technology, this design that I'm creating, and that other people maybe will do in the future, um, must be able to be printed anywhere in the world, in Europe, I don't know where the plants are, um, and be able to be put into action quite fast. So the cleaning um, is when you get a 3D printing, you have support materials and you have all this stuff, you need to remove it be before being able to use it. So at least um, cleaning as possible. Easy to assemble and use materials that are quite common in stores, like wood screws and Velcro and this kind of um, common thing. Um, also, we settled on the Ultimaker 2 as a base printer because this is the printer the client got and fortunately I had one myself. And as the gear is something that actual humans and kids and even uh, adults play with, and you interact with actual walls, doors, and corners, you bump into them, and you bump into other players. So it needs to be able to, be able to handle damage. Um, small parenthesis about this, the robustness. Um, who is familiar with 3D printing? Who has done 3D printing in the room? A few hands, yeah, cool. So um, I will explain a bit of this. Um, you really need to think with print orientation in mind when planning with uh, planning to create solid parts. And also, it's a tough one because we needed to use PLA. PLA, polylactic acid, it's um, a print material that is derived from uh, corn and that doesn't release a dangerous gas when you print them. Um, ABS, the standard choice for this kind of gear, would actually release tyrine, and it's known to provoke cancer from recent studies, so if you use uh, ABS in your prints, please ventilate the room. Um, and also, yeah, no fragile parts. The parts needed to, be, to, needed to be really strong inside. So the way uh, VM printers work is by laying layers on top of each other, which means that you have this layer structure and depending on the angle that the bend or the hit would hit it, it would be more uh, easy to break or not. So this is what I meant by thinking with print design uh, in mind. Quite, quite important. Because the, on a printer, you have often an X and Y surface and a Z one. And um, the Z is often quite higher. But if you print, for example, a rifle, uh, a vertical rifle, then you hit it to the wall, as the layers are like this, it would break quite easily. So no, you need to think of the parts um, being, being able to be assembled, but on a solid uh, orientation. The infrared LEDs, they are really, really small um, com electronic components, uh, like six millimeters wide tops, and they need to stand out of the design, because <laughs> so the camera can see them, of course. Um, thing is, you need to protect them because, as you can see on this uh, image, um, they actually withstand a lot of um, hits and bumps. And so they break, but the support also break. So if you work with um, like really fragile material in glued enclosures, when you break something, you need to replace everything. And that's like 500 euros for a headset. So eh, you're not so happy about it. Um, a solution I came with, I came up with, and used in almost all the designs, was quite easy for a modeler. Just extrude parts on the side, just enough for the direct bump to be avoided, and for the camera to still be able to pick them up. And that made the trick. It's actually quite easy. Also, to avoid to use glue, um, I actually um, clamped the, the LEDs between two printed parts. 
So a small part that, will, that would go inside, inside of the big part. And when everything is uh, screwed up together, nothing moves. So even if the LED breaks, you just open up the model and replace the LED, and everything is good. Um, I was asked to design a bunch of uh, custom gear, and this is, um, I will present some of the models I, I did. Um, so the first project we did together was to redesign the headset um, um, enclosure. The first one was made to work only with Oculus, and they were not sure at the time if they wanted to work with Oculus or Vive. Uh, and uh, also it was quite cumbersome, quite heavy on the, on the front side, so not really player friendly. We, they also wanted to have better audio than the ones from the headsets, and also to be able to use a better mic. So they settled on the gaming uh, headphones, and we chose to uh, strap the um, sensor to the headphones, which means a different type of clamp to be able to clamp to the headphone, and a wire management inside, and actually quite complicated designs. And then it looks like a cross, because you needed five LEDs, and separated by seven and a half, eight centimeters between each other. Um, so yeah, it looks like a cross to fit on the print bed and everything. And it's, it works. I'm not really, really satisfied with the final uh, aesthetic look of it, but it works really well. Um, also, this was the second project I had to deal with. It's a gun prop. I managed to um, sort of Frankenstein different uh, versions of the prototypes together to bring one today. Uh, we could pass it on the audience if you want. Um, the prints are not perfect at all. This is really early prototype, but this is all I managed to find uh, in time. So, yeah. So this one was really created to fit around the Oculus uh, handle as a base, uh, the Oculus controller, excuse me. Um, and inside of this big uh, plastic enclosure, and the one here, there is no electronics at all, um, there was a battery. Um, so here you could see a battery, 10,000 milliamps battery. Uh, the PCB that controls sensors, uh, the LEDs are not uh, represented, but they go inside of the holes. And also, like a one meter long uh, USB cable that would go inside of this um, switch to be able to turn the sensor off and on. As in the early version of this sensor, uh, there was no way for the sensor to know if the game was on and off, so uh, power consumption was quite heavy. And also something for them, they really needed to be able to use uh, consumer grade, easy to find on Amazon electronics. Like those are batteries made for cell phone. And this is like made, I think it was for Raspberry Pi, but don't use it with a Raspberry Pi, you could try it. Um, power switch, and it only comes in a one meter long um, configuration. So here, for example, on this one, I really needed to um, wrap it around the battery and that would also act as a protection for the battery, because if you smash a battery with a hammer or in a wall, it can explode. So yeah, kind of practical, this, a practical way to manage this practical feature. Um, I also made a few uh, sensors for an immersive suit. An immersive suit is when you have um, uh, motors that make the suit vibrate in um, the various places. Um, for example, you get hit in the arm and your arm vibrates, so you have instant feedback in the game. It was abandoned because the, <laughs> the immersive suit company went bankrupt, so they couldn't have the suit anymore. Uh, they might get back to this project later, but they need to find a suitable uh, base suit solution. And as I started with, we redesigned the helmet structure. And that's still quite heavy, actually. So when you strap a, um, a Vive or an Oculus headset on, and you strap on top of that uh, headphones, you need to clamp them together so you're sure that when the player actually moves quite fast, he's not going to lose his gear. Um, also, they have, and this is what they are currently using in the game, a big rifle um, controller. It's sort of an off-the-shelf controller, like an Xbox 360 one. And the thing is, it doesn't get um, the space location, because it's made to play in, in your living room, um, I believe. So they need to strap a big box on top with a battery and with um, all the sensors inside. So this is what the inside of a prototype looked like. 
Also, here is the new way to deal with the one meter long cable. Yeah, this one was really, really, really fun to work with. Um, and also, because the battery needed to be rechargeable, we needed to add these small things in some of the designs to relocate the, um, the USB power in port on the side of the model. So thank you, Chinese people, for making this kind of thing. Uh, I also made a backpack sensor, simple bar with four LEDs straps on the top of the laptop. The more sensor you have, actually, the more, realistic, the more realism you add inside of the game. And all this stuff consumes uh, power, so some of them are battery inside, others don't. Uh, for example, here, this was, was actually strapped on the other side of the backpack for the arm sensor, because you don't want to have the weight of a battery on your arm. And this one was for the uh, bigger battery with more uh, voltage to be able to power up the, the Vive. So the entire equipment could go on for at least a day. Just the laptop would, be, would need to have its battery swapped. Uh, swapped. Um, also, various small handy things. For example, to solve the ergonomic issues of the rifle they bought. Imagine you have a rifle, you are immersed into inside of your game, and you're trying to shoot, but mistakenly you hit the power off button. That means the rifle needs to reboot, you lose the in-game properties, and yeah, not very fun. Before, they used to just remove the button, but they asked me to just make a protection for them. And the rifle, it was quite funny because there was not enough button on the rifle itself, but also on the battery. So two ways to power up the button mistakenly inside the game, solved. And it's not over. Uh, this is going on uh, since, I think, March last year. Uh, no, this year. Um, and we are still working together um, on making stuff happen. Workflow-wise, it's actually quite easy. As I said, I was trained as an artist. I'm not an engineer. And so I approached the project as the artist that I am. So I did some research, some concept art, um, then I rough modeled several um, of those concepts. And when the client was happy with the look it has, I input the measures I took from the, um, from the actual electronics, um, um, uh, controllers and stuff, uh, modify everything, export an SDL, do a test print, see that it doesn't, it doesn't work, so <laughs> modify everything, do a test print, it doesn't work again, and so on and so on, until it works. And then at the end, send to the client with print and assembly instruction, and everybody's happy. So, um, I use the caliper for the measurements, so pretty basic stuff. If you are into 3D printing and you don't own one, buy one, just buy one. Um, and of course, for the modeling part, as I'm a Blender user for a long time, I really didn't want to use a CAD software. I don't like CAD workflow. I really wanted to use the software that I love, and fortunately, this guy. Antonio, yeah, uh, thank you, <laughs> if you're watching, thank you, um, for making at least this measure it. Adon, he made a lot of good add-ons, and I also believe he worked on the grease pencil. Um, this, what this add-on does, it's actually exactly the same thing as this, but inside of Blender. So you can have precise measurements inside of Blender between two vertices, you can measure angles and lots of stuff. So yeah, this actually single-handedly replaced the whole CAD functions that I would need to be able to make this project happen in Blender. So yeah, this is a GIF of what um, a measure it does. So quite easy, you select two vertices, hey, give me the measurements between those two, and then you can create. So that's why I said that I created the base rough meshes, and then I make everything fit together, because this way I could focus on the art. So yeah, classic modifiers, the boolean, um, the, score, the mirror, because who doesn't use mirror when modeling hard surface, uh, and solidify for the complicated shells, for example, in the gun. Here, um, the part around the controller really needed to be uh, quite precise, and so um, yeah, solidify was able to generate the geometry for me. Plus, also in Blender, there's a 3D print toolbox. There was also, I think, it's, I don't know if it's still there, but there is a cool tutorial about it. Quite old, but still interesting to watch about the 3D print toolbox. Um, it's Macauno, I think, who worked on it. Um, and there is various um, stuff in Blender to be sure that you can uh, print the stuff you are modeling. Um, that actually gets um, less and less, um, actually, uh, utility over the years as uh, when you 
use 3D printing for quite a long time, you pretty much know when something is printable or not. Uh, yeah, in the end, it was actually a lot of trial and error. Um, you can see here a um, bunch of prototypes for the, um, the Vive clamps because all the parts that I interacted with are already designed part and engineered part. But they, have, they, they are not just boxes with straight lines. They are really organic and well-designed shapes. So taking measurements for those, it's not really easy. And as I said, I'm not an engineer. This is, I, I did 3D printing project before, but this was the largest scale I, I took, uh, I accepted as a project. And so, yeah, this was really fun to figure out and tinker with to be able to get the final result. Um, yeah, that would, yeah, yeah, that would sum up the technical part. Um, so why, in the end, did I do this in Blender and not in a CAD software? Uh, because in a CAD software, changing the size of a screw, for example, you do it once and it's the same everywhere. Uh, so the small change and uh, major design changes, for example, and again, it won't be, um, it won't be an Oculus controller, but a Vive controller in the end. So that would need to redesign the whole um, clamp thing. Uh, this is quite difficult to implement in Blender. And of course, it's not made for that. But it's something I accepted, because it really allowed me to work with the freedom I needed and I wanted. So to not disrupt myself with thinking math and thinking really stuff I didn't want to do. I, all I wanted to do is create and, and make stuff. So in the end, uh, this is <laughs> my conclusion. More freedom and more speed. This could apply to um, lots of stuff in, in Blender. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>